are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are meeting this morning to uh, continue our work on the Pay Act and also take a peek at a bill that has come back over from the Senate with a few amendments. That's a technical correction bill that we'll do at the end of this meeting uh, around one o'clock. But I also wanted to take a few minutes at the beginning of this meeting to talk about um, some current events. The, um, the tragic uh, murder of George Floyd has, uh, has brought a lot of Vermonters together uh, with a renewed push for uh, reforming our, uh, our ways of policing. And uh, before I give the committee an update on kind of where we are going or where I believe we're going in terms of consideration of the issues that were in 464 and 808. Um, I wanted to give Hal Colston a moment to, uh, to share some thoughts that he had shared with me um, a couple of days ago, uh, just to, to tee up this conversation. Go ahead, Hal. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I um, have been, through this rodeo before. Um, I came of age during the 1960s, during the civil rights era, when most of our major cities were on fire every summer due to um, racism and racial injustice and economic injustice. Um, and over time, um, I think it's fair to say that hope becomes fleeting about real change. And what gives me hope, some hope today, is the reaction that we've seen all over our country, all over our state, by so many of my white brothers and sisters who are now also understanding the harm that comes from this injustice. So it's, it's now is the moment, I think, for us to do something different. And I'm hoping that um, we as a legislative body will do our part as we embark on a use of force bill that I'm really excited about um, some of the momentum that has been created just in the last few days. And I think you'll hear some more about that from um, Madam Chair. But what I hope that we can come away from all this is, is just a deeper sense of empathy. You know, how do, we, how do we work out of our hearts and really understand how we're all wounded by this thing called racism? And if we can only become fully human, I think we'd be in a, a different place. So that is how I see it from my perspective. And I, I hope as well that you're willing to become vulnerable as we get into these conversations and really look inside and understand how you may play a role in perpetuating this, this menace that really impacts all of us. So thank you. Thank you, Hal. Um... This, uh, this has been a, a very busy weekend of, uh, of conversations and planning and um, strategizing, but I want to back up a little bit and just um, remind committee members that before we broke for COVID, um, it had been my intention that when the Senate sent over a miscellaneous law enforcement bill that we would then resume our work that we've been doing since January um, on all of the issues that were uh, that were proposed in 464 and 808 and, and leaving all of those issues out on the table and deciding the best way to move forward. Um, uh, when COVID hit and, and uh, this remote meeting became uh, the, the only way we could get things done, uh, necessarily there was uh, a little uncertainty in terms of whether we would be able to continue work on those bills just because of the very limited time that we have in committee from, from 15 hours a week when we are meeting in person to now uh, at the most four hours a week. Um, 
And so we had set about to have a subcommittee work on some of these issues to try to bring something back for August. And, um, and I just wanna say that now we seem to be getting a lot of, uh, a lot of support and a lot of um, traction from both House and Senate leadership in terms of making room for the committees of jurisdiction to have these conversations. And so I want to just let you know that there is, uh, there is very real conversation about the development of, uh, of, a, of a broad uh, modernization reform bill that will, um, that will, will cover all law enforcement agencies in Vermont um, and will sort of run the gamut between from, from hiring practices and training all the way through uh, you know, policies uh, and tactics, what we do with improper conduct uh, allegations, body cams, uh, it's all on the table at this moment. And so I wanted to make sure that the committee was aware of that. Um, to welcome you if you are interested in being part of those uh, conversations that are ongoing right now to reach out to me and I'll be happy to connect you with the folks who are working on these issues. Um, but, but I wanted to make you all aware and folks who are uh, joining us um, on YouTube make folks aware that these conversations are happening. They're happening between House and Senate leadership. They are inclusive of administration folks. So Commissioner Sherling has been a part of these conversations. And, um, and so these are ongoing uh, issues that, we're, uh, that we are embarking on right now with the hopes that we can pass something meaningful before we uh, get to final adjournment this year. Anyone have any questions on what I have just presented for information? Jump right in if you want to say something. Go ahead, Mike. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to um, I want to thank Representative Colston for his leadership inside and outside the building on this. Um, for a long time, Hal is somebody um, many of us look up to and look to for leadership. And I hear his call for us to walk alongside him. And, and I hope at some point we can create a picture that I'm remembering right now of, of President Obama and the First Lady walking across the Pettus Bridge in Alabama with hundreds and hundreds of people walking alongside and behind them. It's time now for us to come together. These are human issues. These are not political issues. And it's time for us to, to join hands or maybe at a distance reach out. <laughs> but um, it's time for us to come together over this. And I, I applaud Representative Colston for his leadership here. Uh, I'm with you. And I hope we can all walk together. Thank you. Uh, I truly believe that uh, if we are not willing to be actively part of the solution, then uh, we are the problem. And, um, and so we will continue these conversations and this work, even though um, meeting remotely makes that more challenging. Jim Harrison. Yeah, thank you. And, and Hal, I'd like to thank you for your comments and putting things in context. Can you folks hear me okay? I was having trouble with my internet uh, the other day and had to turn off my video. Um, as one who um, has family in the Atlanta area, uh, in visiting last fall, um, we had the chance opportunity to visit the uh, Martin Luther King uh, National Historic Site. And if anyone ever is in Atlanta, I strongly encourage you to visit. It's, um, um, it was uh, not only very enlightening, um, it, and 
seeing the, the segregated South in the history. Um, and while I think we've made progress, obviously, perhaps not anywhere near enough progress, but um, more to current events uh, and the current um, um, pretext that the chair put out there, uh, I'm, I'm curious as to, are you talking a legislative group that's looking to have some discussions uh, on possible changes? Are we looking to uh, see what the governor's racial equity task force comes up with recommendations? Uh, if you could help me with um, some kind of insight uh, as to you know what uh, the game plan might be, that would be helpful. Thank you. So there are companion bills to 464 and 808 in the Senate, and I believe that the Senate will move um, a suite of reforms that that um, rolls a bunch of those reforms in together, and they will likely also add to that um, some uh, some reforms that are being worked on right now that'll come out of the administration. Um, and so while the work that I believe we're looking at legislatively is going to be focused on police reform. I'm really hoping that the governor's task force is looking more broadly at, uh, at issues across society. We've got some uh, serious concerns uh, in terms of uh, health outcomes and health disparities um, in COVID-19 as well as uh, pre existing. Um, and so, you know, there's just a broad range of issues that uh, that I'm hoping the task force will look at um, uh, because they will obviously not be able to begin their work until sometime later this month. So if you're interested in being part of the legislative um, planning, go right ahead and uh, and contact me after committee and uh, and I'll be happy to connect you with the folks who are who are looking at uh, developing legislation. Um, so I think we're going to shift gears now because our agenda didn't really leave us time for these important announcements, but nonetheless, we needed to uh, to take a few minutes. So um, thank you and my apologies to the folks who are with us to talk about Pay Act. Uh, and I appreciate your patience. Um, I think we would, um, so I think that we probably should hear from some of the witnesses that we have with us before we get back into the language of the bill. And so I, I guess I'm gonna ask um, John Gannon if you have a recommendation on, uh, on which of these witnesses we should start with. Um, in committee, I would have whispered to you to say, who do you want to go with first? But now here it is right out in the open. Who do you want to go with first? <laughs> uh, why don't we start with Luke? Um, because I think his testimony would be fairly quick and um, okay. um, is related to some of the other testimony we're going to hear. Great. Thanks for being with us, Luke. Um, take it away. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. And good morning. Can everyone hear me OK? Or, or am I too loud? Great, thanks. I think my testimony will be quite brief, but as always, please interrupt if you have any questions or comments. Uh, everyone who works for the General Assembly is an exempt employee, and that's set forth in 3 VSA Section 311. So in that regard, legislative employees are different from the executive branch because none of us are within the classified system. And I appreciate you taking time to hear from me today. What I wanted to do is to convey the point of view of myself and the other supervisors in Ledge Council. And we're very aware that this is a time of really deep uh, fiscal and financial uncertainty. But we ask you to keep a couple of things in mind as you deal with the Pay Act and maybe in August or September deal with related issues. One of our priorities is to, no matter how bad it gets, to avoid furloughs. And this was done in 2007 and 2008 in the last financial crisis, and it was not positive. So I know that's not something that's on the table right now, but uh, looking into the future, I would ask you to work very hard to avoid furloughs or cuts to people's 
existing salaries. Uh, number two, we still need to fill open positions. Uh, and this is partly the result of how lean we are in Ledge Council and how over time we've eliminated positions and asked people to take on more duties. So looking into the future, even if the situation remains bad in three or six months, we still need to be able to fill open positions. And number three, the reason why I originally asked to testify this morning is it's really important to include session only staff in the pay act. And after last week's testimony, it was unclear to me whether session only staff were included, but after talking to a number of individuals and circling back to JFO, indeed session only staff uh, are included in the pay act number in the current version of the bill. And that's something that was I uh, was very glad to find out. It's really, really important. Those of you who have been here for a while know how hard we've worked over multiple bienniums to increase everyone's salaries to a fair level, but also to increase session-only staff and make sure that they're paid adequately. And I think we're finally at that point, which is why I wanted to make sure that they still can have access to a appropriate pay raise. Uh, I wanted to also convey my thoughts and the thoughts of other supervisors, how important raises are even in very, very tough financial times. And I think you know how hard the folks in Ledge Council, everybody works and in the other offices, but I don't think it's just a matter of working hard. I think we, or at least I hope we do very, very high quality work. And as I referenced a few moments ago, we've eliminated full-time positions over the years. We streamlined duties. Almost everyone in Ledge Council does more than we used to do five years ago. I hope also do it more efficiently. And all of us multitask and wear more than one hat or fill more than one obligation. And so in that context where we're comparatively lean, where we've really invested in being more efficient, I think even in tough times, it's really important to give people appropriate raises. And so I was very, very glad that you are considering that. I hope you continue that and we deeply, deeply appreciate it. Does anyone have any questions? I don't see any and that's uh, all my testimony. And thank you very much for making time. Oh, hold on. I've got a couple of questions popping up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't get away quite that quickly. Uh, Jim Harrison and then Mike Merwicki. Yeah, thank you, Luke, for joining us. It did uh, sound like you were trying to do a quick escape, uh, <laughs> as the chair kind of alluded. Um, you know, we'll be going through the bill in details, but can you share with me what the current draft does or doesn't do in terms of legislative counsel? I mean, I, I see an appropriation, but um, the positions and raises or lack of raises for year one, year two, can you help enlighten us? Well, I think Betsy Ann can follow up and probably give you more information. And Betsy Ann, if I say anything wrong, please jump in. There's nothing specific in the bill, at least the version I last read, that says so-and-so will get this or this um, job title will get that. But it does have a dollar amount. And my understanding is that that dollar amount is was calculated under the following understanding, which is that all year-round legislative employees, with two exceptions, would receive a $1,400 lump sum and then a 1.9% pay raise. That's all year-round folks. Session-only <laughs> folks was calculated they would also get the 1.9%, but not the lump sum. So that went into the dollar amount in the bill, but there's no further detail in the bill about how that would be allocated. Each office would get a sum based on that calculation. Then those offices would, uh, would give those raises to their staff. Okay, thank you, that's helpful. I, uh, you know, I don't know where we'll end up on that. I mean, I certainly for one, and I'm sure I speak for others that um, the entire ledge council staff um, and more specifically, the folks that work with our committee, I think are held in very, very high esteem and work very, very hard um, <laughs> to, uh, to, uh, to do their job and service the, the needs of the state. So um, 
but I also understand the predicament that we're in today too. So, um, okay, if that's helpful. Thank you, Lou. Thank you. Mike Berwicki. Sure. Um, Luke, thank you so much for, for coming in and, and thank you. Uh, please pass along to your staff the, the, our, our thanks for, for the work they do. Uh, I've said it before, we couldn't open our doors without you and, and the staff and let alone write legislation. And uh, I think we've done some good things over the last few years in terms of the legislature looking ahead by socking away some money in the rainy day fund. Uh, in that regard, we're, we're doing okay. We'll, we have some options looking ahead. I would agree with you. Uh, long term, if we wanna keep good staff, we have to take care of them. And we, we would do well to, to hear your advice and not just take care of them, to make sure they, um, they get the kind of raises that'll keep good lawyers here. And I've said it before and I'm gonna say it again, I'm losing a district mate right now because he just can't afford to, to get by on, on what he makes here. And we don't want good lawyers to be lost because they are the essence of us being able to, to draft bills that, that help the people of Vermont. So I, I'm with you and I'm looking forward to working with you moving ahead. Thank you. Bob Hooper. Sorry, I thought Mike would be more long-winded so I'm eating a chocolate covered raisin. Um, my prior discussion with you notwithstanding, Luke, uh, do you think that when the $1,400 was uh, given consideration for the uh, non for the session staff, were we looking at the length of time that those staff are going to be enjoying hanging out in the state house now, as opposed to the normal term that we would have them if we weren't dealing with the virus? I'm sorry, I don't think I quite understand your question. And, and just to be clear, that $1,400 and 1.9% 1 is based on what executive branch classified individuals are getting. So that's where it comes from. But I'm sorry, I didn't understand your question otherwise. Well, non-session staff are getting the 1.9, but not the 14. Um, and I wondered why you know, that was sort of based because effectively, except for a couple of months now, session staff are almost annual employees as opposed to part of the year. So the way it would work is, as I said earlier, the big lump sum that's in the bill, the big dollar amount for the offices divided up. So I don't know how much in the end of the day, ledge council would get but let's just make up a number off the top of our heads. Let's say it's 200,000 or 100,000. The supervisors and ledge council would then meet and we would divide that up. For example, for session only staff, which includes uh, committee assistants, but also drafting operations and some other positions, they wouldn't necessarily get 1.9% because we have a pay plan where we've been trying to increase salaries over time. And some folks start at $18 an hour, some are now up to 23 dollars an hour. So we might not give everyone 1.9. We might give some of the lower paid people a little more. And as another example, there's three attorneys who joined our staff who are excellent, but are relatively junior. So they're paid less. So we might give them a little more than 1.9% where someone who's paid substantially higher might get a little less. So not everyone gets $1,400 and or 1.9%. We try to be as fair as we possible and we divide up that lump sum amount to, to give people a little more if they warrant it. Thank you. Any other questions? Mike, I think your hand is up from before, but if you wanna jump in with another question, go ahead. All right, great. Thank you. Thank you, Luke, for being with us this morning. So John, who do you wanna hear from next? Um, I, I think Beth Pastigi with respect to the twin state paid family leave 
program and it. Okay. So the collective bargaining agreement had uh, anticipated the creation of a twin state paid family leave program. Um, and we would love to hear the administration's uh, thoughts on how to proceed given that that program is not likely to come into being until when? Uh, fiscal, the beginning of fiscal year 2022. So right now we're projected. So one of the things that we're very supportive is a paid family leave for our employees. And we, you know, we, our goal was to offer that program as soon as possible. We definitely got waylaid by that, by COVID. And so our, uh, right, so we, the bid for the vendor is on, um, it's suspended right now. So hopefully, um, you know, sometime within the, coming months, we'll be able to reopen that bid and get some bids from vendors um, who had told us um, basically once they started, um, once they started, uh, once COVID happened that they were not, they would be unable to um, put the effort into putting a proposal together. So once, once that's, once that's, um, you know, we feel like that vendors could be able to provide us with bids um, we will be able to reopen that process with a goal of implementing, um, hopefully, uh, July 2022. So therefore, um, we didn't feel like we needed um, any additional money in payout for 21 to cover that cost. And um, the language is, so the intention, of course, is for us to implement as, possible, as soon as possible, but the union contract doesn't actually say the date of implementation. So the goal is to get that done as soon as we can. Jim Harrison. Uh, Beth, thank you for joining us again. I'm, I'm still confused on the paid family leave plan. I thought I heard in some of the press reports that um, if the paid family leave program did not get instituted for some reason or another, that there would be an additional quarter of a percent increase in uh, pay for state employees. Did I mishear that? Um, 0 0.025, right? Do, uh, I don't know if Gary is there, Gary Holden is there, that it's 0 0.025, it's not a, it's not 0.25%. It's a very small amount. And the, I think the thinking on that was, um, you know, if we, it was really if once we implement the plan and the plan goes away, the plan would go away um, because then the legislature may have created a plan after us that kind of um, superseded the plan. So we want to make sure that the employees had money to make up for what was um, kind of the plan that we had provided and then would sub subsequently taken away. So that money would help fund kind of a mandatory plan that the legislature might come up with. So that was the thinking behind it. Um, and then, um, so that that was the kind of, it was kind of a replacement for what, what we're providing and then take, then sub subsequently remove. Okay, well, um, that's helpful. I guess I would like to get clarified what that percent is. Uh, yeah, let me just double check. I mean, I the, Point two, the two five is correct. It says the. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, it's um zero point two five percent. Right. I think Gary maybe not is saying. So it's one. It's one quarter of one percent. So it's one point two five percent. You're correct. It's point two five percent. So one quarter of one percent. Okay. Thank you. So, given that it's a quarter of one percent, um, in the paid the family leave program is being delayed, is that also kicked in to the increases today? No. When does it kick in? It doesn't kick in because we're going to implement the family leave program. No, I understand that, but you haven't. Well, I, so there's no, to... there's no date certain in the contract of when we're going to do that. We need, we need to do that within the contract period, but it wasn't, there was no language before we implement it. Okay. Um, so but prior to implementation and once there's no, uh, there's no particular contract date for that. Okay. So if I understand 
the contract agreement today, the $1,400 per employees is on average 2.2% of a average state employee salary, I think is what I heard. Um, the average overall step increase, I understand some get it, some get more, et cetera, is 1.9%. So that's right. the total of, again, averages and averages can be misleading. That's a total increase this coming year of 4.1%. Um, now, what you're saying is the paid family leave is another quarter of a point. So now we're up to 4.35% overall. Are there any other benefits that were added that would increase or decrease that final number? There are non-salary pay act items that are generally always included in the collective bargaining agreements um, that continue typically from agreement to agreement. And those are usually considered in a separate portion of pay act, not under the wage portion as, this, as the pay family leave is also not under the wage portion of pay act. Um, it's not considered part of the, it's kind of in the non-salary pay act component or, and how we budget it. Um, that makes any sense. So it's things like tuition reimbursement, which would be similar program that we have the prior years in healthcare, I mean, in childcare and elder care reimbursement funds. There are those other components that are considered kind of non-salary and benefits that employees get, but we do put those in pay act every year. So are, they, are they different benefits than what we have existing? No. Okay, thank you. John Gannon. Thank you. Um, so, Beth, a couple of questions. Um, first of all, uh, this Twin State program is, is the program that, that Governor Scott announced with Governor Sununu. Is that right? Yes, and it's currently just to, it's, it's currently the governor's plan. I don't think that we're really in alignment with what New Hampshire is doing anymore. And we, the bid that we put out was it just a Vermont state. It was just a Vermont state governor's paid family leave program it was it's not a twin state family okay leave program. so the, the, tw the twin state now is sort of a misnomer okay yeah. got it um so if, if the the paid family leave plan doesn't need to be um enacted today under the collective bargaining agreement when does it need to be um, our contention <laughs> would be, so, you know, certainly sometime within the within the two year cycle, the collective bargaining agreement starts in May. But there was no date certain on when that would be would be um, able to be started up. So, but that that confuses me a bit. So, okay, if we move into FY twenty two, um, and the program is not implemented until June thirtieth. Would that mean you're within the collective bargaining agreement? Yeah, I think we'd have Even our- no one's getting the benefit? I would hmm? think so. I mean, that's not our intention. The intention is to get the program up and running as soon as we possibly can and, and uh, provide that to our employees as soon as we can. Okay, because I mean, if it was implemented like on June 30th or at the very end of the fiscal year, um, no one's really receiving a benefit during the collective bargaining period. But I mean, ostensibly, I mean, we try to keep benefits consistent and we would want to keep it going forward. And at that point, if we if we implemented it and then withdrew it at that point, then that raise would kick in. It would kick in even in June. Provided that that's what we negotiate going for the next contract. I mean, all our ben everything is renegotiable, but um, it, typically, you know, we, you know, um, you know, healthcare. Um, we expect that every year we're going to no negotiate, renegotiate our healthcare plans, and sometimes we make changes, and sometimes we don't. Um, you know, and it's always a time in the year where we, a time when we see like, are there changes that need to be made, and that's all a part of the collective bargaining process. So it's, you know, obviously it's a long process, and. Um, it, it takes time. I think the point is right now we're at, you know, we, we have this agreement with the VSEA that we came to in the fall and we're very proud that we actually were able to come to an agreement at the table. It's the first time and one, two, you know, this is the 
third, if we, if we didn't come to an agreement at the table, it would have been the third time um, that it went to the last pass to offer into the labor board. So we're really pleased that we're there. And now, you know, I think now we're at the point where um, it's the legislature's turn to provide or not provide the funding for, to implement, to implement the collective bargaining agreement. So. And you recommend that we implement the collective bargaining agreement. Yes. Yep, and I kind of, the, and the, certainly we're, um, the VSEA and um, the state discuss particulars of the collective bargaining agreement all the time. And there's, we don't always agree perfectly on everything and what the language means, but we have processes to work on that. And I'm confident that we will work through whatever process needs to be on this. Um, it's a very, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a, it's a small, you know, the paid family leave is a small amount um, in, in the overall pay act. And, um, and um, you know, if it's, if there's funding for it, that's okay. If there's not, we'll figure out a way to fund it. Okay. Well, thank you for that. But I, I just, I just want to clarify, you know, for the overall collective bargaining agreement, you know, putting, putting the um, paid family leave component aside for a moment, the, the administration fully supports the legislature fully funding the yes. collective bargaining agreement. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions, committee members? So John, who would you like to hear from next? Uh, either Steve or Gary, um, you know, for on the, the paid family leave issue, just to, to make sure we get the, a full understanding of what everybody believes the collective bargaining agreements Steve. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Steve Howard. I'm the Executive Director of the VSEA. Um, first, I'd like to start by saying we're, we are continuing to um, be ha so happy to hear the Commissioner say that Governor Scott supports the full funding of the Pay Act, and supports the passage of the Pay Act. Uh, we worked really hard to get the deal at the table, and we're uh, very uh, happy to uh, be uh, both supporting the full funding of the Pay Act. Um, so our view is that, um, first of all, I would say that the proposal on family leave that's in the collective bargaining agreement was the proposal of the administration. Uh, and we accepted that proposal. Um, and we support that proposal. The view of the VSEA is that the quarter of a percent um, does have to be included in the Pay Act um, because there one you could you could just interpret I guess a couple of ways um, in the sense that there's no timeline in the contract. You, one could argue that on July first, uh, the administration is obligated to have this plan up and running and the benefit available, or provide the quarter of a percent that they proposed. The other argument is that they have until June 30th of uh, the second year to get this done, or they have to provide the quarter of percent that was proposed. And I think the resolution of that question really is between the two parties. Uh, but the issue for the legislature in the Pay Act is, does that quarter of a percent have to be authorized? Um, and the VSEA's view is that yes, it does have to be authorized. Questions committee, Jim Harrison. Steve, thank you for joining us. Um, so I, I guess I'm a little confused and I appreciate your um, outlying two possible interpretations of the paid family leave program. Um, is that quarter of 1% included in our pay act draft bill at this point in terms of the appropriation in your view? Uh, I, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna uh, uh, call a friend and look to Betsy Ann for that, to answer that question. Um, I did have a discussion with Betsy Ann and I, I think we talked about um, from VSEA's perspective that it had to be included. I don't, I don't know if in fact it was included. I have to, I'd have to ask, ask her. 
ahead, Hi, Betsy. Hello, Betsy Anras, Legislative Council. Um, and I am going to need confirmation from JFO since I get the numbers directly from JFO. However, it's my understanding, I don't know if I'm correct, that the 0.25% is not included in FY21, but is included in FY22. However, I'm not completely certain, and we, we really should hear from JFO directly on this. Okay, um, thank you. Um, Steve, I, I don't know if you were at our last meeting on this subject, um, but I raised the question, you know, and maybe it's just me, but I'm really, really concerned about our current economic situation and I raised the question um, whether or not we might consider postponing the implementation of the Pay Act until August and voting on it in August and then actually making it retroactive to July 1, assuming our revenue picture is better or we're getting federal CARES Act. And I'm curious if um, you and the union have a view on that possible scenario, which again, may be just me, um, but I, I wanna ask that question. So the, the view of, I think we, we actually did talk about this at the previous meeting, and I'll try to give you the same answer <laughs> I gave <laughs> that, um, which is that the VSEA believes that the Pay Act is necessary, um, uh, necessary legislation that needs to pass before July 1st when the new contract goes into effect. So um, I take it then you do not support delaying the um, consideration of the Pay Act until August when we have a better idea of our revenue. Uh, we, well, we believe that it's necessary because the current contract expires on June 30th. We believe it's necessary for the new contract in the Pay Act that corresponds with that contract, um, that, that pay, the Pay Act has to be passed by July 1st. And if the revenues aren't there to support the Pay Act, uh, which they aren't in current forecasts, um, uh, even our latest numbers this morning, which were better than they were a month ago, um, still show a deficit of, I don't know, 320 million or more for the coming year. Um, the, I guess the alternative would be to furlough employees, which probably none of us want to see. So do you see any other possible outcomes? Well, I think any time, uh, once a collective bargaining agreement is in effect, um, the discussion of the, of that agreement really is between the two parties. So it would be incumbent upon the governor to, um, make decisions that, um, would uh, that his administration feels are in the interest of the state and VSEA has always been open and willing to hear any suggestions the administration has. Uh, I will remind, um, well, I, I think I would leave it at that and just say that um, if uh, the administration has, once the, once the contract is in place and the pay act is passed, it really is be, uh, an issue between the two parties. So are you suggesting the union, if our situation is dire as it may appear today, uh, a little bit later this year, second quarter, end of first quarter, that you might be open to a conversation to look at the contract again? Is that what you're saying? I don't think I'm quite saying that. I'm saying that the VSCA okay. is always willing to hear what the administration uh, would like to offer. Okay, thank you. Questions from committee members. All right, Steve, anything else you uh, you want to add? No, I think that's it, Madam Chair. Madam right. Chair, could I could I Madam Chair, could I clarify just one thing? I the, was hoping you would. Thank you. Okay. So not to create controversy between our uh, commissioner and my executive director, however, um, um, the, the negotiated agreement, and I did negotiate that as the chief negotiator for VSEA, 
um, does intend that if the if the insurance were not implemented prior to the um, second year of the collective bargaining agreement, that the 0.25% increase um, would be put into place. Representative Gannon was going down the correct path, I think, in his questioning, that if there's not a point where the um, either the insurance or the um, corresponding compensation kicks in, then it's really not an agreement at all. So um, that is correct that um, the governor has an opportunity to um, implement this family medical leave insurance plan. Um, and if, um, if it is not implemented or implemented and discontinued, that state employees would receive the extra um, one quarter of 1% increase. And the discussion and the agreement at the time was, was that in the second year, if it is not implemented or at any time in the first year, if, they, if the governor were to abandon um, uh, seeking to have the insurance implemented, then the BSCA would request that the 0.25% um, be activated. So at a minimum, um, it, if the plan is not implemented prior to the second year of the collective bargaining agreement, that BSEA would um, would move to make sure that that quarter of a percent were uh, included in the second year pay raise. Thank you. Rob LeClaire, who do you have a question for? Uh, Gary Hoadley, please. Uh, good morning, Gary. So I just want to make sure I'm clear what I heard you say is that if the pay family leave wasn't implemented by year two, then the quarter of a percent pay increase would be expected to be implemented then. Is there anything retroactive about that? Or it would just all sort of begin and end in year two? Uh, the agreement is that it would be it would be um, implemented in the first full pay period following the decision to to implement that uh, quarter of a percent. So um, if if the governor currently had abandoned efforts to um, to implement this family leave insurance plan, we likely would be moving at the beginning of July of this year to implement the quarter of a percent. Our understanding is that that plan uh, implementation is still in process. Um, however, if the plan is not implemented um, throughout at some point during this next uh, fiscal year, or the governor um, is does not intend any further to implement the plan, we would be requesting to enact that quarter of a percent. But it would be in the first full pay period following following. Um, our notice to to the state. It's so not so answering it wouldn't be retroactive to any point, in my opinion. It would not. It would not. Okay. Thank it you. It would be going forward, not. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Bob Hooper. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. General question, maybe Betsy Ann. Um, the, the Pay Act and it, it's prompted by Representative Harrison's question for delay. The Pay Act sets certain salary ranges for and funds certain things. Uh, but if July 1 is when it goes into effect and as in Representative Harrison's situation, we don't fund it until August or something, uh, the state is not authorized until the Pay Act is passed to pay salaries in that gap? Or is this an authorization bill as well as specific to funds is my question. Yes, both authorization and funding. So right now it's set up to provide increases um, beginning at the fiscal one, fiscal 21, um, beginning of the fiscal fiscal year 21, which is July 1 of this year. Um, if the General Assembly were to not enact it by July 1st of this year, 
Um, then there is the language in a separate statute that provides that if the General Assembly does not fully fund the collective bargaining agreements, the state and the bargaining unit need to go back to renegotiate the amount based on whatever the General Assembly does provide. And also the Pay Act provides uh, increases for statutory salaries. Um, and so those statutory salaries would remain as is under current law until the General Assembly did enact a Pay Act to provide any of those increases. Thank you. Does that address your question? Yeah, more, more than I required. No, no. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions from committee members? Okay, I see Rob's got his hand up, but I think that was from before. So dive in, Rob, if you need to ask another question. Um, I think at this point we need to go back to the language and uh, and have Betsy Ann um, go through that with us. And I believe that you have an updated um, draft of the bill, John Gannon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, um, Stephanie Barrett's on now, so we might want to hear from her. Uh, about whether the paid family leave, leave well, the 0.25% the is included in FY22. Um, ah, excellent. Thank you, Stephanie. Sure. Um, the, uh, my understanding is that the, the uh, calculations that Dan ran in the last um, estimates that he gave to Betsy for the legislative appropriation in 2022 does include the 0.25, the 0.25% in FY22. That was one of the last pieces on the back and forth between uh, he and Harold to come to you know closer um, estimates. And that was one of the missing pieces in terms of the cost, whether it's through the leave program or the 0.25, but it's a, it's a cost estimate for FY22. Thank you, Betsy Ann. And just while we have Stephanie, uh, to confirm my understanding from talking with Steve, it's the, it's to all branches, not just the legislative branch. Yeah, it, it is. It, it was calculated in the judiciary. Also uh, revised and in, included it in their revised calculation. And I understand it was always in Harold's calculation for the okay. executive branch. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. All right, Jim Harrison has a question. Yeah, Stephanie. Um, I noticed that the numbers in the first quarter appropriations bill were a little different than what's in this current draft. Um, what, I mean, does this bill, like if it's the last one passed, is that the one that uh, we utilize or is there some other thing going on that the numbers would be different? Uh, there, no, there should be only one in the end to be clear, it should be only one appropriation. The appropriation for FY21 should be the most recent estimates. The reason they're different in the quarter one bill as it's passed this morning out of the house is those were our early estimates last week. Um, and so the purpose of, of actually having that section in the quarter one bill was to create a place um, it's not uncommon for the Pay Act to end up incorporated into the budget bill in the end. Um, and so it was basically, it's an appropriations bill, a large chunk of the, um, the Pay Act expense is early in that first quarter. Um, and so the decision was to put only the FY21 appropriation in that bill, but the expectation is either it will be um, corrected in the Senate or replaced in a Senate, depending on what the decision is about the Pay Act bill itself. Um, the, the sort of simple thinking was in the past, Pay Act has been sort of folded in on occasion into the budget bill and timing, et cetera. It was just creating a placeholder for that if necessary in the quarter one bill. But the expectation is that the best estimates and what is in the draft right now, the Pay Act bill before you for FY21 appropriations are the correct appropriations. And we only, in the end, want one appropriation in one place 
for FY21. <laughs> and <laughs> we, you know, we, we created a, a, you know, a, a little bit of a duality here, but the expectation is we come back to just one place somewhere. Okay, thank you, that's helpful, <laughs> thank you. All right, John Gannon. Thank you. Um, another question for Stephanie. Um, when you testified last week, Stephanie, I think there was some disagreement between you and Harold uh, about legislative, the legislative appropriation. H has that been resolved? That has been resolved. And the last piece to be resolved was that 0.25%. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Yep. All right. Rob LeClaire. Sorry, Madam Chair, I think I left my hand up from last time. I apologize. You, your arm must be really tired. <laughs> you should probably put that down. All right, any other questions for Stephanie while we have her here? All right, nobody is diving for their button. So Betsy Young, back to the language. All right, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, committee members should be able to see draft 3.2 on your committee webpage. Thanks to Andrea for posting that. If you just would it work, Madam Chair, do you want everyone to just follow along on their own doc rather do, than doing share screen? Committee, are we okay with following along on a separate device? And if anybody needs it to be um, projected, you can just wave your hand and I will ask Betsy Ann to share screen, but otherwise um, go to the committee page and uh, find the document under today's date. Thank you. Great, so only a couple tweaks from the last version that you reviewed. Um, the, the first tweak is just to, that I, I revised the statement of purpose on the first page of the bill just to better describe more fully what the bill is doing. So this is just a high level summary of the Pay Act draft. So if you just wanna review it together, this is a summary of what this Pay Act bill would do. Fully fund the collective bargaining agreements um, applicable to state employees in the executive and judicial branches in both fiscal years 21 and 22. Secondly, authorize compensation increases for exempt employees in the executive branch in FY22, consistent with the FY22 collective bargaining agreement increases. Number three, adjust the compensation for our statutory state and county officers in FY22, consistent with the FY22 CBA increases. Four, what was not included in the description before, but importantly, amend the legislative pay statute so that beginning in fiscal year 22, legislative compensation is adjusted consistent with the compensation increases provided to other constitutional officers. Remember the issue there being is that legislators right now are only entitled to the COLA, not the step increase like the other constitutional officers are. And then finally provide the appropriations to fund all of the compensation increases for all three branches. So that was a revision to the statement of purpose was the first tweak. Madam Chair, do you want a high level jog through as I go through the whole thing or do you just want me to point out the other little tweaks? Let's do a high level jog through. All right. So just as a reminder, section one is a narrative description section to state explicitly that by this pay act, the General Assembly is fully funding the collective bargaining agreements applicable to um, between the state and the VSEA and the state and the Troopers Association for the two year fiscal year period. And as a reminder, right here on the first page or the second page, it's that those increases provide an FY21, an average 1.9% step increase and the $1,400 one-time payment to employees who are employed as of July 1 of this year, and then an FY22, an average 1.9% step increase and a 2.25% across the board increase, and that results in a total 4.15% increase. Section two is the second tweak, um, and that's that language that you had requested to 
put in here in explicit terms that although this pay act is providing increases to employees not covered by CBA in fiscal year 22, the General Assembly might have to revisit those increases because of the fiscal issues that the state is facing in response to COVID-19. So under this reader assistance heading of other compensation increases in fiscal year 22, to distinguish it from the CBA increases, um, this section two would address the potential to reduce or eliminate other compensation increases in fiscal year 22. It says that the General Assembly may amend the provisions of this act in subsequent legislation in order to reduce or eliminate the compensation increases this act would provide in FY22 to employees exempt from the classified service who are not covered by a collective bargaining agreement and to officers for whom compensation is provided in statute if necessary to address the fiscal needs of the state in response to COVID-19. Does that committee meet your uh, intent of the language you were seeking? I feel comfortable with that. I'm willing to take a pause here to see if anybody else wants to weigh in on that language. But to me, it, um, it does send a very clear signal and um, an intention to check back and make sure that we aren't just putting this on autopilot. <laughs> Not that I think there's any chance that anything related to the budget will be on autopilot for the next um, next legislative year. So, but I appreciate that and I don't see any hands raised. So I think we can keep moving. Okay. So you won't see another tweak until the appropriation section at the end. Um, and it was just a revisiting of those numbers as uh, Stephanie had discussed, going back over the final appropriations, but that's not until the end. So now we're just gonna revisit the provisions that we already looked at. So I'll do more of a high level overview. Um, section three, is allowing exempt employees in the executive branch to get compensation increases in FY22, consistent with the FY22 collective bargaining agreement, and that's 4.15%. Uh, section four is that definition section about what it means in a couple of statutes that use the total rate of adjustment available to classified employees under the collective bargaining agreement. Um, this definition applies to executive assistants and uh, exempt agency and department heads and deputies. And so this is defining what that term means. And you'll see it's just saying that those exempts um, are able to get an FY22, a 4.15% increase, which is consistent with the FY22 CBA increases. Section five is just in here as technical corrections to clean up to the language. It's also provided for reference because it's one of the statutes that are that has that phrase that's defined in section four, that 32 VSA 1020B. All that is happening here though is just cleaning up the statute to make it fit our statutory structure. No change to the language, no to the substance of the language. Then once we get down to section six, the bottom of page five, um, this section six in subsection A amends the annual salaries of our statewide officers, and that's providing them with an increase in FY22 of 4.15%, which is consistent with the CBA and FY22. Once we start to get down to page seven, um, this is amending the statutes that provides the base salaries of the heads of our departments and agencies in the executive branch. And again, is just providing um, an increase to that base salary in FY22, um, the 4.15% increase, which is consistent with the CBA in FY22. Jim Harrison has a question. Yeah, sorry, I didn't know if we should ask questions by section or if we should wait to the end. Go ahead and jump in by section. Well, so as we're going through all the uh, individual salary changes for the second year, I guess, Betsy Ann, maybe we talked about it before, but is there anything that says that we can't take that entire 
section out and potentially talk about it next year? I mean, this is all for fiscal year 22, correct? That's right. Um, and that's what uh, that new language in section two was meant to address, that the General Assembly may revisit those compensation increases in FY22. On page two, um, it includes the increases that this act would provide to officers for whom compensation is provided in statute. Okay, so uh, maybe I missed that then. Um, so this would put all those increases into effect if we did nothing, they would all take place. Um, as opposed to not putting them in and force ourselves to look at it. Just yeah, a different approach. Different approach, policy decision of the, the approach you wanna take. Um, because for example, if you look at our, let's look at our statewide officers here on page six. Um, it says annual salary as of July 4, 2021. So those salaries, that increase in salary will not take effect until July 4, 2021. July 4 is the beginning of the FY22 right. pay period. So you could leave it in. And if you want to reconsider or reduce or eliminate, um, if this bill were enacted as is, General Assembly could always come back at the beginning of the next year and amend or eliminate these increases. That's what this bill is currently structured to do. Or you have the second option, which is what you just mentioned, Rep. Harrison, is to remove this and then um, revisit the issue at a later date. Yeah, except that taking them away after we've already put it in statute might be hard politically. Um, I've been called in the press as a supporter of the governor. He might not support me too well if I was part to cutting his pay. So uh, just something to be aware of. Thank you. I'm gonna keep right moving ahead. along through here. Thank you. Um, so we already looked at those base salaries beginning in FY22. Um, down, I'm on bottom of page nine. Um, there's a reference to the director of OPR and uh, likewise the director of OPR would get an increase um, in FY22 to the base salary consistent with the FY22 CBA. Page 10 in section seven, we get into the judicial branch and providing judicial officers with a pay increase in FY22 um, consistent with the FY22 CBA. So you'll see section seven amends the annual salaries of judicial officers. Section eight on page 11 amends the daily pay of assistant judges. And again, that's an increase in that daily pay beginning in FY22 of a 4.15% increase, which is consistent with the FY22 CBA. Same thing that's going on on page 12 in section nine, amending the annual salaries of the probate judges beginning in FY22 with a 4.15% FY22 increase provided in the CBA. Page 13 in section 10 makes those same in compens compensation increases for sheriffs in FY22, 4.15% in FY22. Same thing that's going on on page 14 in section 11 for the state's attorneys, the actual elected state's attorneys of each county amending their annual salary beginning in FY22 by 4.15% consistent with this FY22 CBA. Then on page 15, starting in sec 12, we get to the amendment to the legislative statutory salaries. Um, it provides first what your salaries, legislative salaries will actually look like um, in at the beginning of the 2021 biennium. Um, and that's with no increases to what legislators receive now. It's just updating the statutory figures because you see right now it's referring to what the salary was in 2005. It hasn't been amended since 2005 because right now in the language on page 15, 
um, starting in line 19. It shows that legislators get an annual compensation increase that's adjusted um, consistent with the cost of living adjustment negotiated for state employees under the most recent collective bargaining agreement. Cost of living adjustment only, not the step increase that other constitutional officers are also able to get. And to remind in this year's um, uh, collective bargaining agreement, there is not a cost of living adjustment in FY21. In lieu thereof, there's the $1,400 lump sum payment. So legislators are not receiving a compensation increase. What this language would do starting on page 15 is to provide what your what legislative statutory salaries will be at the beginning of the 21 biennium without increase from today, but providing that beginning on July 1, 2021, which is the beginning of the FY22 fiscal year, and annually thereafter on January 1, the annual legislator compensation shall be co adjusted consistent with the compensation increases provided to other constitutional officers. So if other constitutional officers do indeed get what, uh, what this bill would provide right now, which is the 4.15% um, increase beginning in FY22, which includes COLA and a step increase, then that's also what legislators uh, will receive in FY22. It's doing so because there's two legislative uh, statutes. There's one for the speaker and pro tem. That's what is getting amended here on pages 15 and 16. You see they get an annual salary and a weekly salary. And then other legislators compensation is provided in page 17 and section 13. Um, and the same thing's going on here, showing what other legislators uh, weekly salary will be actually at the beginning of the 2021 biennium, and that's what you're getting paid now without any increases. But provided that, I'm on page 17, line seven, beginning on July 1, 2021, beginning of FY22 fiscal year, and annually thereafter on January 1, the weekly compensation shall be adjusted consistent with the compensation increases provided to other constitutional officers. Same effect. So this means if this bill goes into Law as is, legislators would receive in fiscal year 22, the 4.15% increase, um, which is both COLA and STEP equivalent. At the bottom of page 17, we get into the appropriations section. So the appropriations to actually fund um, these increases and the collective bargaining agreements starts out by defining the, uh, or providing the appropriations for the executive branch on line 20 of page 17, it says that the two-year agreements between the state and the VSCA for their bargaining units, which is the Defender General, non-management, supervisory, and corrections bargaining units. And for the purpose of appropriation, the state's attorney's office's bargaining unit, um, since they're um, not technically executive branch employees, um, but they're included in the executive branch appropriation. For the two-year period of the CBA, that's July 1, 2020 through June 30th, 2022. Um, and for the collective bargaining agreement with the Troopers Association for that same time period. And salary increases for employees in the executive branch not covered by the bargaining units. Here's how they get funded. In FY21, it starts out by providing the amounts that are coming from the general fund, the 11.2 million. From the transportation fund, the 3.8 million. From other funds, um, where they those might be special fund, federal, or other sources, it's uh, 14 million. On page 19, line three, there's that uh, transfer authority that is included with every pay act. And then it gets into the FY22 appropriations. So same language. The amount from the general fund is 13.6, the T fund 4.7, and other funds are 
page 20, line nine is just discussing explicitly that the appropriations um, would need to include sufficient funding for exempt pay plans that are authorized under statute. And that's referring back to that 1020C that's included in the bill for reference. Then it, the bill gets into the appropriations for the judicial branch. Um, starts out with some intro language about the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court being able to extend the judiciary CBA to judiciary employees who are not covered by it. Um, and then provides language um, about the funding. So to fund the two-year agreement between the state and the BSCA for the judicial bargaining unit for that two-year period and for salary increases for employees in the judicial branch not covered by CBA um, and FY21, there's $872,330 from the general fund and FY22, um, $1.293 um, from the general fund to the judiciary. So judiciary has employees covered by CBA, um, and then they also have their judicial officers, people who have, whose salary is provided by statute, um, and then they do have some non-CBA employees. And I think, I believe the court administrators provided information on that to the committee. And finally, in the legislative branch, there's just language um, for the two fiscal years. Uh, fiscal year from the general fund, um, fiscal year 21, 241,000. Fiscal year 22, 434,000. In fiscal year 21, as we, I've, I understand it as the, the testimony has been provided to this committee, this would cover, this would provide pay increases um, to year round legislative staff, um, except for the top two right now at this point. Um, consistent with the FY21 CBA, that's the 1.9% increase plus the $1,400 lump sum. Um, and as I understand it, this FY21 appropriation would also cover the 1.9% increase for our seasonal employees, but those employees would not be able to get the lump sum in 21. In FY22, that 434,000, is providing to all legislative employees and legislators um, increases consistent with the FY22 CBA. So that's the 4.15% increase. Finally, section 15 is the effective dates saying that this takes effect on July 1, 2020, except that the two legislative pay statutes would take effect on January 1, 21. So it shows January 1, 21, what the actual legislative pay is now without increase. But remember within the actual text of those statutes, it says legislators would be able to get the compensation increase at the beginning of the FY22 fiscal year. Thank you. Uh, Bob Hooper has a question. A question and a statement. Um, statement first, it still bothers me that we have certain people working for us in the legislative branch that are temps and get no sick leave, no vacation, no retirement. Uh, and then the question, in the provision for the Supreme Court to extend the benefits to non-bargaining unit and non-statutory, where does that money come from? Since it doesn't seem to be allocated anywhere. It is coming from the general fund and um, the chief justice would have to work within the funds that the general assembly is appropriating to um, the judicial branch here in this pay act. So some increases would be mitigated by other ones that aren't funded so they wouldn't go over their allocation. I don't know if I'm uh, completely understanding the question. Uh, so the judicial branch would get this uh, appropriation from the general fund for both fiscal years. Um, it would need to cover their collective bargaining agreement employees. And then um, I don't know if the court administrator provided specifics on how the court, uh, the court plans to um, 
or to whom compensation increases other than CBA employees, um, who would get them in fiscal year 21? I'll see if maybe there's any language that we have here that I can turn to. If you have questions about who gets increases, Representative Hooper. Well, it just seemed like all of a sudden somebody was granted the authority to spend more money than they had been allocated uh, in the language that seemed here. It, you're right, it's not broken down as far as the appropriation. So uh, I'll withdraw the question and stick with the statement. I think the, the main answer to your general question is the, the Chief Justice can only work within the appropriations granted to the judicial branch here to be able Thanks. to fund these increases. John Gannon has a question. Yeah, I think this question is directed to Betsy Ann, and if it's not to Betsy Ann, then it's to probably Steve Howard. Is um, it, it's it's my understanding that the um, state's attorneys and sheriffs haven't ratified their collective bargaining agreement yet. I, mean, I think that's a testimony we heard last week. Does that matter as far as passing the Pay Act? Are you asking me? Or, or Betsy Ann, I'm not sure who. So, I mean. I, I can, uh, well, I can say that they may have not ratified their contract yet. Um, I don't. No, I, I don't think it really should impact the Pay Act. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, I, I'm not sure it's unprecedented that that contracts there are, that um, that appropriations or uh, authorization of the Pay Act. Uh, I'm not sure it's unprecedented that contracts haven't been ratified. For instance, I'm not sure the VTA's contract was ratified yet. And I'm, I, I, re, I read the language, I, I understand the legislative intent of the intro in section 14A um, to say that it, it's the two year agreements between the state and the VSCA or the state's attorney's offices bargaining unit is what's getting funded. Um, and so that's expecting that there will be a contract and if so, this appropriation would fund that contract. Okay. Um, it, it, so just another question with respect to, to the legislator pay increase, um, it's tied to the constitutional officers pay increase. Um, if the secretary of administration decides that the, the governor won't take that pay increase, that's not gonna change the legislator's ability to get a pay increase. Is that true or? That's, I would believe, I believe that to be true. Um, if we go look at the language provided to our other constitutional officers, um, you can see this is uh, section six, which begins on page five, line 17. It's that each elective officer of the executive department is entitled to an annual salary as follows. So the governor is entitled to get that 191,754 at the beginning of fiscal year 21. So that's the compensation increase that's provided to the governor there. But if the governor does not want to accept or any governor doesn't want to accept that full salary, I, I, that's within the discretion of that officer. It's still the General Assembly is providing the compensation increase authority to that constitutional officer. So I don't, I don't read that okay. as impacting the legislative pay statutes. Okay. And it was actually, it was, it was a, uh, I forget how many years ago, but it, appropri House Appropriations, I re um, wanted to ensure that all of the pay statutes, or as many that they could find, um, were amended to say, shall be entitled to receive instead of shall receive um, in cases of officers, any officer who didn't want to receive the full amount of his or her salary. So and I just want to clarify something. If, if we do nothing today, I mean, if we don't pass the Pay Act before July 1st, um, that's going to force the VACA and the state back to the negotiation table. Is that correct? 
that's how I understand the statute um, that provides, and I think it's what, 3 VSA 982, is it, or 925? I can find it quickly, but that if the state does not fully fund the collective bargaining agreements, the state and the bargaining units are supposed to go back to renegotiate. That My understanding of that statute is consistent with the testimony as I've understood it also um, from the stakeholders, the VSCA, and I believe also the Department of Human Resources have testified that if the Pay Act is not enacted into, into law by July 1st, that the parties will need to go back and renegotiate. Thank you. Committee discussion. So we have we've heard testimony from um, a, a number of different entities. I think as many as we um, could find who want to weigh in on this. And uh, now is the point where we can entertain uh, discussion or any lingering questions. So Jim Harrison. Uh, the other day, um, I think, uh, my friend from Wilmington uh, asked some questions about uh, the expenses and the round trip mileage reimbursement. I wonder if there's been any further thought to the wording of that. I think Betsy Ann sent something out on what the current statute is. I don't know, maybe that's a, a, a question for Representative Gannon. Go ahead, John. Um, so, you know, I've been, I've been thinking about that. And, you know, depending on what hat I wear, uh, um, I, I do have concerns about people, to, you know, claiming mileage um, when um, they're not actually driving their own vehicle um, and carpooling with somebody else. But then I was thinking about it um, and I didn't come up with a solution, but is, you know, from a sort of climate change perspective, don't we want people to carpool um, to the state house? And so is there a way to incentivize that? Um, I, I'm not sure we have the time to get the answer to that question, but I started to really think about that because uh, I mean, well, I do have concerns about people claiming that expense I also would like to see more legislators carpooling together. I mean, the fact that I think we have like two or three carpool spaces is is ridiculous. I mean, um, you know, especially coming from Wyndham County, there, there's no reason I couldn't be more open um, to carpooling with other members um, from my county. I mean, I drive past many of their homes probably. I mean, I know I've, I've carpooled up with Senator White in the past. Um, I just, so, I'm still trying to figure out an answer to that. And so that's why I have not pushed that issue. Okay, thank you. Any other committee discussion? Ra, uh, Bob Hooper. I echo John's comment and throw the same paradox on the uh, fact that we don't encourage an electric car purchased by everyone. Um, and question at this point, is a motion to move the bill forward appropriate? It is, that is what I'm hoping we will end up doing. I will so move at this point. Thank you. Second. <laughs> Jim Harrison. Um, so my main motion may be out of order. Um, so I, I was going to uh, ask that we uh, postpone consideration of the bill until we, we return in August. Um, I have some, I, I am all for honoring agreements made. However, we did not make this agreement and it was made in a entirely different era. Um, this agreement over two years, depending on how you count the paid leave, is the equivalent of an eight and a half percent or eight and three quarters percent 
overall or average increase. It's over $66 million in appropriations uh, across all branches of government. Um, this at a time when we have in excess of 20% unemployment. And as I said before, hundreds, if not thousands of businesses that are on the verge of going out of business permanently. No one's fault. I'm not blaming anyone or anything. I am really hopeful that come August, we will have a much better picture of the economic situation that we are in. Uh, and that we can enact it as agreed to um, and make any one-time payments uh, that are called for retroactive to July 1. Um, I think to do that otherwise um, is being blind to what is going on in the economic uncertainty that we are all facing and could require some pretty dramatic decreases in state government. So I am very uncomfortable. I would be comfortable considering this in August. Um, additionally, the fact that we are putting into statute increases for ourselves in the second year, as well as other elected officials, um, I think is again, being tone deaf to what is going on in the world around us. So I would, if, if appropriate, if the other motion supersedes it, so be it. But I would, my preference would be to postpone this conversation and discussion and enactment of the bill until August. Uh, John Gannon. Um, thank you. I, I mean, one of the two things I, I, I tried to clarify with testimony today, a couple of things that I think are really important for the committee to understand. Um, number one is if we delay action on the pay act beyond July 1st, that will force the, the executive branch and the SEA um, and, and the other unions to go back to the bargaining table. Um, so that, that is the decision we make by doing that. We also heard once again from Beth Fastigi that the administration supports their negotiations of the collective bargaining agreements. Um, they have not asked us to do, Jim, what you're suggesting, which is to delay this until August. Um, they've asked us to, to fully support these collective bargaining agreements. Um, and you know that's what I hope we will do today. Mike Merwicki. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'm supporting the original motion that represent when Representative Hooper put up there to pass this bill. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty out there. There's a lot of chaos out there. We don't need to create more. We can create some certainty by passing this. We need to look at it again, we can, but we've got an agreement here. It took a long time to, to, to get to. Uh, seems to me all the parties want to move this forward. Uh, I don't want to start creating more chaos, and I think that's that's what it would do if we if we passed on this. We're we're here to make some decisions right now. I'm ready to make that decision and and move forward to approve this. Rob Leclaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I um I've been thinking long and hard about this and. Um, as the bill stands right now, I can absolutely not support it. Um, you know, we're in an unprecedented time here. And as we've heard several times, not one single state employee has been laid off. Not one single state employee has been furloughed. And I get that. Um, it is an unprecedented time. But like the member from Chittenden said, if we pass this, we're looking at almost upwards of a 9% pay increase for those of us in the private sector that have to pay this. There's a lot of us in the private sector that aren't gonna see any pay increase. In fact, there's a lot in the private sector, those that are paying these salaries and benefits that aren't gonna be around. 
when we have a 20% unemployment rate, I think it's unconscionable that we're looking to Vermonters to pay this. Yes, this is a negotiated agreement that we had prior to this. And the comment was made that the administration supports this. Well, there's a lot of stuff that the administration supports that the legislature is very, very happy to go back and change after the fact. We've got several large pieces of legislation that we're going to be working with in that regard right now. Um, I know the executive director of the VSEA has said a few times that he feels that any employer that doesn't meet the state's standard as far as paying benefits, like exploiting their workers, well, this makes it very, very difficult for any private employer to meet even closely to that. We're already 4.7, $4.6 billion upside in pensions. And now we're going to add to that problem. Um, I just think it's irresponsible for us to go ahead and approve this when we all recognize that we're in unprecedented times. We're fiscally more in trouble than we've ever been before. We've been through this rodeo before. I've heard that phrase today. And either pay raises were deferred or in some cases contracts were asked to be reopened. Um, I think it's inappropriate for us to go ahead and approve this as it stands currently. So I will be voting against this. Thank you. JP. You're gonna wanna unmute yourself. You're right, sorry about that. I had written down some notes so I didn't forget things. And I've been kind of waiting and biting my tongue and taking in a lot of things. And I've talked to a fair amount of people in the last few days on this. And I'm, I'm still consistently getting, getting the comments from my constituents as to, you guys keep raising taxes and raising taxes, raising tax. You're killing us down there. You're, you're, you're literally killing us. You're starving us. Haven't had a job. In, in three months, I wasn't eligible for unemployment. I, I'm, my, my credit cards are maxed out. My, my uh, savings account is gone. I have no checking account. I'm, I'm about ready to start bouncing checks if I can get away with it. Uh, you know, and these are pretty hard, hard things to hear. Uh, I heard this a couple times in committee when the questions was asked and answered a couple few times and it really bothered me, but the answer is very true uh, from what I've been told in committee. And the question was, did any state employees get laid off during this pandemic? The answer was simply no. The question was posed another way. Did any state employees lose any money during this pandemic? And the answer was simply no. I really can't say that for very many other people that I'm aware of that are striving to make a living to feed your family. Um, I'm having great, great difficulties. Um, I know an agreement is an agreement that you, or excuse me, the agreement that was reached was, a, was an agreement that everybody thought they could live with. But this was done at the time that we didn't have this pandemic. We anticipated millions of dollars in revenue coming into the state this anticipated revenue is no longer here. It's gone. It's gone. And we've got to make up this lost revenue somewhere. I personally hate to say it, but I would, would love to see this go back for renegotiation, go back to the table. And unfortunately, if that's the only way it could be done, then I certainly can't support this bill as, as it is at, at this point. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam not Chair. Other committee discussion? All right, I'm not seeing anybody diving for their raise hand button. Um, and so we have a motion from Bob Hooper to, uh, to pass the bill out. Does anybody want to get any more information in their heads before we go ahead and do that? 
All right. So Marsha, when you are ready. I am ready, Madam Chair. Go right ahead. Okay. Gannon. Yes. And Warren's not on the call, is that correct? That is correct. Rowicki? Yes. LeClaire? No. Harrison? No. Gardner? Yes. Lassick? No. Cooper? Yes. Brownell? Yes. Colston? Yes. Copeland Hansis? Yes. Seven three one is the vote. The motion carries. Thank you very much. Um, thank you to Beth for sticking around with us and Gary and Steve. I appreciate your um, your participation in this process. We're going to shift gears at this point. So um, unless you are just really jazzed by the subject matter that the Government Operations Committee has, uh, you're, you're welcome to sign off and we'll see you on another day. So committee, we need to um, we need to switch gears to look at our technical corrections bill, which was uh, presented on the floor by JP and Marsha um, and uh, Jen Carby from Legislative Council will be with us momentarily to help us understand the changes that the Senate made. So I think I'm going to give everyone a moment to uh, to stretch their legs. Uh, Jim Harrison, you've got your hand up. I was going to suggest a break. Sorry, you beat me to it. I read your mind. <laughs> um, so I'll ask Andrea to throw up the "We'll be back in a moment" uh, screen and remind everyone to mute their um, mute their Zoom and stop audio or excuse me, stop video for a few minutes. Um, and we'll be back just as soon as Jen Carby is ready to join us. Thank you. All right, I see some folks popping back up on the screen. Um, uh, Jen Carby is in the middle of a House Health Care Committee meeting, so she hopefully will pop in to join us in just a few minutes. But I thought if we could come back and have a little committee discussion, that would be uh, a good use of our time. Um, the Just to remind you what, uh, what we laid out for um, <laughs> for a path last week. Um, the speaker has, at, has invited us to make recommendations with respect to COVID relief fund money. Um, I know that there have been a number of emails from the Joint Fiscal Office reminding us what uh, the parameters are um, in terms of use of COVID relief fund monies. Uh, and the speaker invited us to, uh, to be thinking more along the lines of, um, hold on just a moment, asking Marwicki to start his video. Did that help? Yes, it did, okay. Um, the speaker has invited us to think in terms of having a, uh, a larger um, possible uh, recommendation for investments in August than what we have now um, with the understanding that, um, you know, our committee's area of jurisdiction uh, runs broadly across uh, state government. And if we have uh, recommendations on how uh, COVID relief funds might be, uh, might be used, we could spend some time doing some preparations for that. So I'm gonna admit Jen Carby right now and, and leave committee members with a reminder about that, um, that dynamic and an invitation to, um, to reach out to me if you'd like us to begin to work on um, on any particular recommendation. Rob LeClaire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, is there a dollar amount? I know I'd heard that each committee was sort of given a, a, a budget based on their purview. Do we have a number you're working with, Madam Chair? I realize it's 
in, in flux? It, it's, uh, it is very much in flux. Um, and uh, I expect that there will be some committees whose uh, recommendations exceed um, <clears throat> exceed the the box that they were given to play in but i believe that this the box that our committee was given to play in was a recommendation of 10 million dollars in this first go round and 50 million as a possibility for uh for the august time frame john gannon you'll correct me if i'm wrong on that no you're perfectly right thank you all right um, so thank you, Jen Carby, for being with us. I do so appreciate your, uh, your ability to switch gears quickly in the middle of your day. Um, we just want to take a jog through the changes that the Senate made to our technical corrections bill, and, uh, and then the committee will make a decision on how to proceed. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer Carby, Legislative Council, thank you for your patience and flexibility. Um, so you have, I think you have two documents that I sent. Um, one is just the Senate proposal of amendment and the other is actually a summary document um, that we prepared at the very last minute when requested, uh, when a summary was requested, but I also included a summary of, a more detailed summary of the what of the Senate Government Operations Committee amendment. Um, so the Senate Government Operations Committee struck three sections at my request uh, and and amended the effective date. It's all my request, so um, blame them. Blame me, not them. Most came out wrong. Um, so the amendment would delete three sections from the bill that you passed. Those sections amend 26 VSA sections 373A, 1400F, and 1734B subsection A. The, they all relate to license renewal extensions for podiatrists, physicians, and physician assistants who are serving in the military if an activation or deployment would impede the licensee's good faith efforts to make timely application to renew a license. And as passed by the House, based on language we had provided, the proposed changes to those sections would have updated terminology that refers to components, various components of the military, and it also made changes to language regarding military activation and deployment. But after you passed the bill, uh, we were notified, I was notified by the um, Board of Medical Practice, David Hurley from the Board of Medical Practice, who's also a uh, recently retired longtime uh, member of the military, that some of the proposed revisions around the activation and deployment language, which could have substantive and unintended effects. Um, and so the the proposal of amendment to strike those three sections would delete the sections from the bill in their entirety so those unintended consequences wouldn't happen. Um, the pieces that still make sense to do around updating the um, terminology relating to components of the military are added to being added to other bills. Um, H438, the Board of Medical Practice bill, addresses the podiatrist and physician provisions, and S128, the physician assistant licensure bill, does the updating for the physician assistant provision. So those three sections would come out of the bill entirely so as not to monkey with, with any of the, um, the deployment and activation language. And we're still making the updates to the, to the terminology that everybody seems comfortable with, um, but we're doing so in the substantive bills on those topics. The final instance of amendment just fixes a uh, cross-reference error in numbering for the um, effective date section, making sure that the, that the section number given matches the description of the section itself. Should have been section 299, not section 300. That's it. All right, questions from committee members. Marsha Gardner. So since I'm probably the person who will present this, um, just for clarification, this only applies to those people applying for these particular licenses who are from the military. Right. It's actually license renewal for podiatrists, physicians, and physician assistants who are serving in the military and might not be able to renew their license during the otherwise required timeline because of an activation or deployment. Um, and so 
really all you'd be doing is taking the sections out of the bill so that they don't have an unintended substantive effect, which is something we don't want to do in a technical corrections bill. Um, and then it's just for your your own information and your colleagues, if you want to share it, that the the pieces of it that did make sense to fix that just update the language describing various components of the military um, are still being made, but they're being made in the underlying in the substantive bills addressing those topics. Okay. Okay. JP. Uh, question for Jennifer. Now you said that these these specific uh, items being eliminated from or via the amendment from the Senate have been taken up in other bills that we've addressed. And I'm very familiar with some of those. Um, but my question is, is anything that's being eliminated here now being taken up in other bills? Are those other bills going to, are, are the, the items being in the other bills, are they going to expire when the pandemic is over? Or is it going to be? No, they're not. No, they're, they're not, not related to that. Sure they're not COVID related no. type things. Nope, they are uh, license licensure type ongoing bills, right. not COVID. That's my belief. I just want to make sure that that's the yep. case. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, John Gannon. Um, and, and just to follow up a little more on JP's question, I, I mean. Both um, H438 and S128 are on the House calendar. Um, so they should true. be coming up um, very, very close in time um, to our report on the Senate proposal amendment. That's true. So they will have already been included in those bills. They will have, in fact, probably just recently been addressed. Right. Great. Any other questions for Jen Carby? All right, I don't see anybody diving for their little blue hand button. Um, uh, JP. Keep forgetting to hit the boys button. Would it be appropriate to, to uh, move the amendment? Um, I think the motion that we are looking for here is to concur with the Senate proposal of amendment on H788. Okay, I will make a motion that we concur with the Senate proposal on the amendment. Ex Excellent. Any committee discussion on that? All right, seeing none, Marsha, when you are ready. Shannon. Yes. Marwicki. Yes. LeClaire. Rob, are you right. there? Yes, sorry. I Thank double you. clicked my button. Okay. Uh, Harrison. Yes. Gardner, yes. Classic. Yes. Cooper. Yes. Brunel. Yes. Colston. Yes. Copeland Anzis. Yes. So the vote is 10-0-1. Great. Thank, Thank you so you. much. I appreciate your time, Jen, and we'll let you get on with your busy day. Great, Thank going you. back to healthcare. Thank you. Excellent. Doesn't even take very long to walk down the hall anymore. Just have to jump from one Zoom to the next. Um, so that completes the business that we have before us today. Any Questions or um, committee discussion before we sign off? All right, great. John Just, Gannon. So the Pay Act goes to the appropriations, right? Yes, it affects the appropriations of the state. I assume that they will need to give it their once over, but now that you say that to me, um, it occurs to me that a couple times since we started remote meeting uh, bills that we thought would head automatically to a money committee uh, didn't necessarily head there. So you might um, you might check in with the clerk's office on that and um, 
I'm going to ask uh, John Gannon to, to please be the presenter of the Pay Act on the floor, which will be, I'm sure, great fun because he's not going to get any interrogation um, or amendments for that matter. But uh, yeah, if you want to just make sure that uh, that the clerk is reminded that this bill needs to go to appropriations, that would be fabulous. Great. Thank you, Marsha, for your great work as clerk. Thank you, Andrea, for uh, for being so supportive. Um, Andrea has gotten to the point where she's anticipating things that I might ask for, and um, and basically has them for me as soon as I as soon as I ask her for them. So I can't tell you how wonderful that is, Andrea. Given all of the complications of meeting remotely and um, and how hard it is to get things done, um, you've been an absolute uh, critical component to this team working. So thank you. I think that uh, I think that completes our work for the day. So we can go ahead. Thank you.